we're in an election year. Yeah, you know, an election year where presidents get elected, the president of, uh, or the prime minister, I uh, can't even think of what his official title is, of Russia just got elected. Let's see, Iran also had an election, and the United States is getting ready to have a major election for the presidency, as well as changing you know, the guard, so to speak, of different people in charge. It's kind of funny because over in Israel, which is the modern day example of what a democracy is like, about every time that you know somebody doesn't like what the prime minister says, they can demand an election immediately and stop all government from working. All they have to do is bail out of the coalition. <laughs> and it happens regularly in Israel, so they don't get an election every four years and you're stuck with somebody. They can do it anytime they want to. You could call them a real democracy and we're more of a two-party system. We're not really a democracy, if you kind of understand prophecy. So anyways, it was kind of interesting was that, you know, in our dealing with biblical prophecy today, you know, and that's what our segment is, is that we wanted to keep this discussion going about the end of the world, you know, because obviously it's coming. But not this year, and not today. Because, you see, the end of the world is one thing. You know, when you say the end of the world, and whenever you get into topics like biblical prophecy, you need to identify the words you're using because people are abusing prophecy words. They're changing the meaning of them rather than what they actually are. For instance, the end of the world is literally a term that really covers a couple of things. A lot of people use it for the rapture because it's kind of like the end of the world as they know it or like the end of the world and you know, kind of like the end of maybe the age because you see, we're living in a time that's called the age of grace by some, which really isn't an accurate biblical term, or the age of the church, which also isn't a biblically accurate term <laughs> because it's not in the Bible. But the end of the age is what Jesus talked about, that there would be some kind of age that we're living in that would end in, literally, his return. So up until you know his return, then we're in a certain age, and during that age, certain events are going to happen. And so a lot of people kind of talk about the end of the age, but they don't necessarily mean after Armageddon. They kind of mean really up to the seven-year tribulation period, or the great tribulation period, or the the time of when you know there will be three and a half years of peace, and then three and a half years of eh, things falling apart. People seem to forget the three and a half years of peace because they always act like you know there's going to be and I believe in this with all my heart soul you know and well okay forget the heart soul mind and strength I believe in this with all of my studies in 35 years that there is a pre-tribulation rapture but not really for the same reasons or the same way that most people do because I studied it you know I, I said okay you tell me now that I've accepted you know the fact that I can find a scripture one or two you know maybe a few more but I can find some biblical sound theology for the rapture. Now show me the scriptures that other people have added to the rapture. And so I studied on that and I know what doesn't fit the rapture. What really is about the second coming and not the rapture. Because a lot of people don't really know that some of the scriptures they quote for rapture don't apply to the rapture. It applies to the second coming and that's why you have some people in the body of Christ that are really confused because they know that there's no way that a certain scripture could fit the rapture. You know, they have reasons for it. And the rapture people want to have as many scriptures they can find so they add some extra ones, you know, because <laughs> they don't really study and say, hey, it's okay to not have that one as long as you know that there's an event coming, you know, a harpazo event, some kind of event where there's a snatching away that we really don't have a complete understanding of. But since there's been this big added scriptures to it, we now have all kinds of added things to the rapture, you know, added things to the end of the world. We even have added things to what the signs of the times are. It's funny how people are, in these last days, adding things. You get it? They're adding Mayan prophecies into last days. They're adding interstellar linear you know, alignment of the planets. That's funny. Let me look. I don't see it. They're adding gravity wells. 
thermodynamics, polar shifts, <laughs> earthquake. Well, earthquakes is in there. Hey, we found one. Earthquakes. Oh, well, we've had them all along. Oh, well, okay, that's kind of a sign. Or is it a symptom? Hmm, we'll have to figure that one out. Because you see, a lot of times people are getting into adding symptoms of something and calling it signs and sometimes making words fit where they don't belong and changing meanings that really don't apply to biblical prophecy today. I want to talk to you about 2012. I really don't want to talk about all the words that don't apply because we're going to get into in biblical prophecy today as a video series studying prophecy. We're going to get into it in a way that's practical because we're going to take time. We have some time. We're going to study words. That's what we use in Bible prophecy. And we're going to apply accurate meaning from the Bible of what the Bible says it means. Because you see, everybody will tell you, well, this word means this, and this came from this, and this is that, and that's that, and that. But they won't just say, leave it alone. Don't add your meaning. Just let the word speak for itself, and then let the Holy Spirit speak to the person. You see what I'm saying? Let me say that again. Let this read the way it reads. Don't add your meaning to it. Don't add your interpretation or your commentary. Read what this says, then tell me what applies to it from the scripture, how the Bible interprets it with its own words. And then don't give me all the extra mumbo jumbo you've added, spaghetti soup, goulash, hot air, commentary. Because, no offense, the majority of prophecy conferences need money, need people to go. They get a lot of people there and they all get wound up and they all throw out all these ideas and they hash and rehash all this wild speculation. It doesn't have anything to do with prophecy. It has a lot to do with really good question because we don't want to call them false prophets because they kind of know the truth. We don't want to call them inaccurate because they have a lot of accurate information but they've added to prophecy and that's the danger do you really want to add to the scriptures when it says bluntly to not do that or do you want to do like some have done you know take the scripture and interpret it in a new way <laughs> Chuck Smith used to say something about what's old is new what's what's new is or new is bad or old is good or something like that I can't even remember the expression I just never thought it would be a relevant statement until now. And now I realize, wow, he's right. You got all these people that are running around claiming, I got something new, you know, like the pictograph Hebrew. <gasps> we found out some pictograph Hebrew, so now we can make up our meanings for it. And they did. And then some Hebrew scholars came along, like Hebrew for Christians and Jews for Jesus and stuff, and said, you know that stuff you've been like playing around with? That's false. That's not true. Well, they still have got a whole bunch of followers, you know, following them now because they all got involved in it. But it's not true. Sorry. Or like the ossuary, when it's disproven, now it's like people want to believe that we found a new grave site for Jesus. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to find Jesus in it, right? Is that what you're telling me? You see, there's constantly going to be, because it sells, this hype of adding things to your study of Scripture. You should be studying what is proven and what is known. What we know, we know. You can ask Jesus about it and he will reveal a lot to you personally. And he doesn't really want you to kind of go running around about. But, you know, you can study for yourself and discover if you want to. If not, then just go with proving what people say, like me. Take me to task on the scriptures, you know, to prove what's in here. Because once we study the prophecies, I think you'll see that for it to be biblical prophecy, it's 100% accurate. There's no wavering back and forth. There's no, if this happens, then this is the prophecy. If th that happens, then this is it. Or like right now, you know, it's people ask me, and this is what I mean by 100% is 100% in prophecy. They ask me, well, 
why do you believe that 2012 isn't the rapture? I said, pretty simple. Some things haven't been fulfilled. I said, until they're fulfilled, 100% is 100%. God has not fulfilled all his promises to the state of Israel, much less to the European economic community or some type of 10-nation confederacy to prove to me that those nations are fulfilled in prophecy. It's like, yeah, you know, it looks like maybe 80% true. Or like when now people try to make this image of the Imadi, you know, this whole new idea that the Antichrist is the Muslim Messiah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the Muslim Messiah has come along. Let me see. We had the Mormon Messiah, and we had the Inca Messiah, and we had the Nostradamus Messiah. And we had the Jewish Messiah. By the way, the Jews have picked messiahs about every three or four years. You know, I mean, I remember when um, Menachem Schneerson was called the Jewish Messiah. <laughs> okay. So now we have a Muslim Messiah coming. You know, the Ahmadi kind of idea. You know, that somehow we're going to see this. Ooh, you know, crescent moon revival thing. You know, it's like. I'm sorry. That'd be like telling me that, you know, Confucius is going to come back, you know, and that we're not looking for the return of Jesus. We're looking for Confucian to revive. You know, I mean, every nation in the world and every country and every religion has some type of messianic figurine in it. Why are you buying into prophecy being sold by prophet scholars that want to make a name and somehow convince you that we have the right idea now? It wasn't that one. It wasn't that one. Now it's this one. And we're not saying it could be, we're saying it is based upon these scriptures. And so they give you five scriptures or four and then reinterpret them, you know, to fit. And then maybe one might fit, but you can't even prove that one. And you kind of go, uh, what happened to the old Messiah? You know, the one that was like the Antichrist, you know, that was the false Messiah that would deceive, you know, the Jewish people. And I don't think. Let me get this right. You're talking about an Islamic Messiah that's going to somehow deceive the Jews? You confuse the Jews? You Islam? I don't think so. <laughs> Come on. Think. That's why we're having this discussion. you got to start thinking up here. Don't just put faith in your favorite prophecy scholar. Start putting faith in studying the scriptures on your own. Meaning, sure, listen to what somebody says and then kind of go back to Google, you know, look up the scripture and say, I want to look at this, you know, and then start looking and reading it. Because as you start to read it without anybody telling you, by yourself, say a prayer, let God be there, you're going to get kind of your own idea and then you're going to kind of ask your own questions. And then if you have a computer, you could go your own way into Google and kind of research things. You may find some interesting things, like Chuck Visser tells you lots of interesting things. But he'll tell you, prove all things. I can prove some things that he says are questionable. Meaning, maybe, probability, he's pretty good at probabilities. But do I believe that it's actual? No. Why? Well, because... He draws supposition based upon scripture, which is a good thing. That could take you probably somewhere around the 50 percentile group up into maybe the 80 percentile probability factor. But the potential for being misled is as great when it's coming from a man inspiring to find something as it is from when God reveals something and man has to tell someone else about it. Because we know that if you get five people maybe 10 in a line, and you start telling one at the beginning, by the time you hit the 10th one, it's not the same as it was in the beginning. It's kind of one of those funny things. When you start like listening, you know, and kind of like telling people things, they don't all hear the same thing. Sometimes that's what we have to reevaluate when we sit down and if we were wise, we would have a bunch of people sit down and discuss it and say, here's what we're going to discuss, this one scripture, let's see how it fits. What do you think? Do you think it fits? What's your reason? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. 
Well, then, you know, what is, what's your reason? Well, yeah, well, okay. In other words, we should be proving what's true for 100%. And until we all agree 100%, somehow, I don't think that, you know, maybe all this new stuff is really all that wonderful for learning prophecy, but that you're probably going to get deceived into thinking that this year, by the end of the year, you better be wound up. You better have your preppers on, you know, because you got now you got wackos and weirdos that are sitting on Discovery Channel making money. Oh, they don't tell you that part. Getting fame. Oh, they don't tell you that part, you know, about being a prepper so they can release a book, you know, and get a movie deal. <laughs> they don't tell you that part. And that's kind of what prophecy conferences don't tell you about when they have people there. Do I get to set up my table for my books? Okay, I'll be there. What if they just came and said, I don't have any books. You know, I don't even have a presentation, but I have the Holy Spirit, and Jesus has inspired me, so I want to tell you about prophecy. I want to tell you about Jesus coming again. Do you think anyone would pay to come see that person? He did Jesus. They may not have paid, but they came to hear him. And it's funny how people want to be tickled and people will indulge them. So, in discussing 2012, we want to kind of remind you of things that birth pangs are not Jesus coming. When you see these signs begin to happen, don't be confused or abused for this is just the beginning of woes, Jesus said. That there would be tribulation. He didn't say great tribulation. There'd be tribulation. You're just going through kind of like false labor times. You know, you're seeing some things. You go, oh, look at that. There's more 7.0 earthquakes. Oh, wait a minute. There was more 7.0 earthquakes in 2000, or was it 2011, than there are in 2000, or 2010, than there are in 2012 and 11. They subsided. But I thought that was one of our signs that we invented or we said was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Wasn't that on one of those prophecy sites? Oh, yeah, I know where. And they go back to look and it's been yanked. Funny how that works, isn't it? Unless it's in a book they printed. I wonder who keeps those around. Or we look at, boy, last year, remember how everybody was all hyped up. Man, you know, the end of the world is coming because, you know, after all, Harold Camping said so. He added up the number of years. And everybody was pretty convinced, except for they thought he numbered it wrong. So what number does he come up with now? 2012, at the end of the year. No, it's not. That's just one man's opinion about one thing. He didn't have it wrong about his salvation experience. He's saved. He didn't have it wrong about wanting to see the Lord. He wants to see the Lord. What he had wrong was his way of not being all the scriptures fulfilled 100%. You see, that's what you need to prove. What in 2012 makes you think that this is the year? Well, Jesus said, you know, be ready for you know not the hour of the day when the Son of Man will return. You know, and it's, well, it's true. Frankly, you don't know what hour or day you're going to die either. You know, so it's kind of like a common expression in a way. You know, it's kind of like, you better be ready anytime. And that's true. You better be ready anytime to meet your maker, to meet Jesus. Now, when it comes to getting into a specific topic like the rapture, then yes, I will say, no, it won't be 2012. When it comes to meeting your maker, yeah, it could be right now for you, you know, <laughs> or me. But I doubt it. I think God said I was going to stick around. Bummer. But when it comes to seeking to know the signs of the times and the events that we live in, didn't the people talk about how there was this great big, oh wow, spring event. It's a spring sale. We're changing governments. Never mind behind the scenes, there were other governments working in those governments to help bring down those governments and to rearrange governments because now they're getting some government contracts, you know. But we don't talk about that part where we've been manipulating behind the scenes to do what we want to do according to our own worldview, but not 
prophecy being fulfilled. You see, God knows what governments are going to do. So he rearranges them and puts different people in charge because he knows who's going to try to manipulate this government. Kind of like what we did with the Shah of Iran. You remember the Shah of Iran? You know, when we had the first Iranian crisis back in the 50s and 60s? Oh, and do you remember the second Iranian crisis when we had it in the 70s and 80s? You know, the end of the world, Iran's going to, you know, all that stuff, you know. Oh, you don't remember? Oh, that's convenient. Because, you see, we keep saying this Iran thing because we want to make Babylon fit or not fit in a certain way. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, we got to get Iraq in there and get Iran in there, and now we're going to throw Afghanistan, and somehow we're going to make the Khomeinis, you know, into something, and we're going to kind of do this one and that one. And then, oh, by the way, with the Taliban, you know, throwing us out of Afghanistan. You know, what's kind of interesting is that Afghanistan's going back to the way it was from the very beginning, and it's still the same way that it was from the very beginning, and they've already survived Russia, survived America, and they're going back to the way they were anyways. That tell you something about how circular history is or how circular prophecy is. You see, it goes full circle back to one starting point. In here. You don't reinvent prophecy to fit your current circumstances. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Back in the 1800s, they said, Israel will become a nation. And some people laughed at them. They said, hey, no way. Israel will become a nation? Look, you know, the Ottoman's empire is over there, or the Turks have it, or I can't even remember who had it at the time in the 1800s. Come to think of it. But it was swampland, worthless, meaningless. Even Mark Twain went over there you know, and said, this place sucks. <laughs> I love that quote. This place sucks. <laughs> it's like, this place is disgusting. You know, it's horrible. This is supposed to be the Bible lands? <laughs> yeah, right. So it was all horrible. It wasn't much of a prophecy then, was it? Oh, but that's when the timetable started. When Israel became a nation. Because that's when we know we're in the last generation. Of course, then they got into, well, since we're in the last generation, maybe we better count out, you know, like 40 years or count out 80 years, or count out 120 years. But we can't make 120 fit because we have this one other scripture that doesn't fit. Or does it fit? Wait a minute, what did God say first? And how does it all work together? It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Does it fit perfectly? You know what I found interesting is that when Theodore Herzl at the World Zionist Congress said, today we have a nation, Israel, 120 years later, someone else said, Today we have a capital, Jerusalem, undivided. 120 years. Exactly. Ooh. That gives me goosebumps. But you see, you're not hearing too many Western prophecy scholars talk about the World Congress of Zionism. They don't talk about Zionism. They talk about Christian Zionism. You know, the one that says support Israel no matter what, whether they do sin or they're wrong or they follow God or they follow the Antichrist because we know Israel is going to follow the Antichrist. So we're going to support them no matter what. Are you sure you want to say you support Israel no matter what? I don't think so. Because you see, in prophecy, people are getting misled to do things they shouldn't be doing because they'll walk right with Israel to the Antichrist and embrace them. Oh yeah, you're a great savior of Israel because you're willing to give away the land for the sake of peace. What did Netanyahu tell me? Hmm. What did they call him at one time in the past? You see, there are things that are kind of like working around that's kind of like making me nervous, you know, that maybe you don't think about because you're a Christian Zionist, you know. When they call Bibi our king over Israel, the ungodly, ultra-Orthodox, the Orthodox, who are his power base, we're calling him king over Israel. Melech Israel, Melech Israel, Melech Israel. Ooh, and that was the first time he got elected. And I wrote about it, and I said, if there ever was a prophecy that people should be watching for, you don't want Netanyahu in office, 
to be the one who sells out Israel to the Antichrist, do you? Who fulfills prophecy by selling out his nation? Or do you? Careful. If you're not studying, you're being deceived. Because you'll walk right into Christian Zionism and say, oh, we love Israel even when they murder people. We love Israel when they kill people. We love Israel no matter what. And God says, I, I think I called some of my people, you know, children of Satan. So do you love them too? Because, frankly, I've already dealt with them. And I'm dealing with them. And while well, all Israel is going to be saved, the ones that I call children of Satan aren't going to make it that far. They're going to get wiped out during the tribulation period. If they haven't already been wiped out, wiped out in Holocaust. Because there's a show us still coming. What was past with six will still be accomplished in the future with many more. And it's a tragedy. Because anyone that dies without Jesus is going to hell. Jew or Gentile. And we were called as a church to witness to the Jew. Okay. Do you know that? Because the spirit of prophecy is about Jesus and fulfillment. It's about fulfilling his word and not somebody's interpretation of events trying to construe when it's going to happen. If your prophecy, when you try to fulfill it, doesn't somehow point to salvation and towards the realization of the redemption of souls saved by Jesus cost on the cross, dying for our sins, then you may have been off target because when you're trying to put Islam into fulfillment, are you really providing for the salvation of a Muslim? Or are you just condemning one-third of the population of the earth? Because you can't see how they're going to get saved. I think we're supposed to go witness to Islam, not condemn them by calling them Satan's followers? I, I don't know. You know maybe, maybe my prophecy studies are a little different than yours. Maybe, maybe when I read the book of Revelation, I get something different. Because you see, people want to interpret for you what's going on in the book of Revelation when Jesus said, just read it as it is, the way it is, without trying to make it symbolic, allegorical, time conscious. Just read it as an event. Read it from cover to cover, bluntly, Genesis, uh, Genesis from Revelation 1 all the way through, and maybe you don't get it, maybe you don't understand it, but there's a blessing it says for reading it, and I don't mean out loud. Just read it through, and then read it through again, and then read it through again. And keep reading it until you get it, because I got it the first time around. It didn't get that complicated to me. It's kind of like, okay, I'm not sure where that fits in, and there are a lot of questions that I have, but that's like, from here, reading it over and over again. I have a lot of questions <laughs> that I ask God, but I didn't really need anybody to interpret it for me because I kind of got it. And I think you'll get it because if you're adding to this, you're going to come up with the Imam, you're going to come up with Muslims and Islam, and you're going to come up with these weird ideas about Psalms and kind of these off-the-wall ideas about how it's going to apply to America. <laughs> which I would love to take a year on to explain how America is not in prophecy until I convinced every single living soul in America that no way in hell or heaven that America is in prophecy. Sorry, not there, won't happen. But I wanted to point out in this discussion about 2012, you're going to be deceived. You are. I, I, I can tell you this right now. You are because you've already started 2012 by being deceived and everybody was into it and then they kind of like faded out. Because now it's like, well, you know, the, the, the debt crisis isn't as bad. You know, money isn't as tough. You know, everything's making a comeback just like it did the last election year when we had all this happen and the one before that one and the one before that one and the one before that one because it goes in cycles. And the one in the past, it keeps going in cycles. So, Will the next cycle be more fulfilling? Yes, because that's a cycle of birth pangs. But as things wind down and you see Syria is not going to do what everybody wanted to, there's no internal revolt, some dictator crushes it, 
and nobody's doing a thing about it. Let's talk about Africa. What happened to Africa? You know, people aren't really talking about that, what's going on. But Israel sent help there, and they're still talking about it. You see, sometimes things take time to fulfill. Kind of like when Congo got split up and some of the other countries got split up. God will bring nations boundaries and changes of people in charge all the time. That's normal. To see Syria change its regime, no big deal. To see Iran change its regime, no big deal. To see Egypt change its regime, no big deal. As a matter of fact, in Israel today, when I was reading it, they were saying, you know, this persecution of Jews will disappear as it's already begun to decline once you know the elections are over and people get settled into their new democracy. They are completely predicting restoration of everything back to the way it was under the dictator, Mubarak. Because when people finally let God lead, his word gets fulfilled. And when prophecy scholars let God lead, they don't invent other things to try to fulfill prophecy. They don't look at the signs of the times and say, this is it right now. This is fulfilling it. Because it's only giving a symptom. So don't look at Syria today and think that that's the end result. Don't look at Lebanon today or the latest Gaza uprising or Sinai desert, you know, megalopolis being built by, you know, people that don't want to pay taxes in Israel, they go over to Sinai and develop something there, you know. Nobody talks about the illegal drug trade and how the Israelis go over into Sinai in order to party, you know, with all the other people that are partying there, getting away with all kinds of, like, corrupt stuff. We don't talk about that kind of stuff, you know, like trafficking, you know, human trafficking and stuff, you know. We kind of keep those off the sidelines, you know, because we don't want to talk about how Israel is also into genetic engineering with humans as well as with, you know, animals and livestock and everything else, you know. We don't talk about too much about that either, you know. <laughs> you know, let's be careful because, after all, the benefit that came out was we found Alzheimer's cure, or somewhat. So you see, be careful what you get involved in unless you investigate all of it because you need to do 100% research on everything you believe in before you start getting convinced that it's accurate. Me, and that's why I share with you and I wanted to talk to you about prophecy today about 2012, I spend 100% time on every single detail of every single nuance of what I am convinced with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength about prophecy, which is why I have serious problems with some of the things said about rapture. I have real serious things about what some of the things are said about I'm trying to think of one. <laughs> the only real serious one is the rapture because people have blown that out of proportion. It's like, once you find out the truth that there is a rapture, you know, you're, you're happy. You know, you're content. You get to go maybe. You know, 50% go, 50% don't. You know, maybe half of that or one-third of that. But the point is, once we get into it, if you begin to understand, if you have a dynamic personal relationship with God and you're ongoing, you know, and you love Him and He loves you and you're spending time with Him and you're talking to Him, He'll let you know. You know, He'll let you know if He wants you to go in being rescued or... If he wants you to stay, like in six out of seven letters and letters to the seven churches. But see, I can throw out these statements about how you can find proof, but unless you've read it over and over again, you really don't get it. Because somebody told you what to look for. So you only look at one piece of it. But if you read it over and over again without people telling you, I'll bet you this, the Holy Spirit will begin to tell you what he wants you to see. And then you'll begin to understand why I say, if you got a question about some of these, like words they're using and they're not using them right, you're on the right track. But if you're accepting what people are saying about the world is coming to an end because the buy-in said so, I don't think you understand about civilizations and how that's not that big a deal for one civilization to be missing. I mean, we talk about Mu, we talk about Atlantis, we talk about all kinds of things. Matter of fact, you know, Worlds in Collision was more interesting to me than, you know, cause I'm, some of the prophecies that people are spewing out as though they were true. You know, I remember just recently that, you know, there was this big prophecy site, you know, biblical prophet. Well, anyway, don't say it. But um, this big prophecy site that kept saying, well, we can't, you know, honor Chuck Smith because he, he implied that, that uh, 
the world was going to come to an end in 1988. And when I went back to find the proofs, I didn't see anything. And when I kind of remembered, you know, and talked to people, I said, no, not really. You know, just Chuck, normal Chuck saying what Chuck always said. And I said, well, Chuck always says it could be. He never said it would be. Or 1980 or something. I don't know. Hey, this prophecy site had, you know, listed him as like, you know, wacko or whatever. And I said, so... Let me get this right. Jack Kelly, who said that the end of the world or that the rapture was going to happen in 2011, is okay? And they were like big into Jack at the time. And I love Jack. You know, Jack's cool. You know, and they said, well, yeah, Jack's cool. I said, okay, well then, at the end of 2011, if it doesn't happen, are you going to ban him? Because he's very adamant about it. Yeah, I'm pretty convinced, you know, 100%, you know, you know whatever. And so as it turned out, it didn't happen, you know. So then he just kind of said, look, you know, I believe that, you know, the rapture is going to happen. And I don't agree with him on some things on the rapture. Everything else, he's like the Bible answer man. But rapture, I think he's kind of, you know. But he says, you know, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then, you know, the rapture happened. I'm like, well, I believe the fullness of the Gentile comes in, but, you know, I'm not going to go with that's when the rapture happens and that it's not on a you know, biblical feast because he's very saying, no, it's not, or it might be, or it could, you know. But anyways, the point being is that they didn't use and abuse him in the way that they did, like, say, Chuck, who was very famous for, we were all Jesus freaks. We all told you Jesus is coming. And some of us never quit saying it. I never stopped. Jesus is coming. I never thought he would come before 2012. I've always said he won't come before 2012. Before, I used to say, well, if he does, you know, it's possible, but I doubt it. That's all I would say. You know, I said, probably after 2012. Then about the year 2000, I started saying, he ain't coming. <laughs> you know, he's coming after 2012. You know, 2000, no, I wasn't one of those 2000, you know, trippers that, you know, was trying to say that the end, you know, 2000 was going to be the end of the world. I was over there in Jerusalem, actually, for the, the turn of the century, in Israel, you know, on a rooftop in the old city, you know, and I was like, man, it was cool. We were all just kind of like laughing about how people were carried away about this, that, and the other thing, and you know how computers were going to crash. I know enough about computers to know that was baloney. But um, we were all drinking hot chocolate and just laughing about how people were so into this, you know, into the world thing, you know. And uh, <laughs> what a dud. <laughs> I mean, it was the biggest dud in the world. Guess what? There's a bigger dud coming. 2012. Nothing's going to happen. It's going to go on similar to what you've seen. There's going to be hype. There's going to be hyperbole towards the end of the year. Right now, during the summer, it's going to die down. People are going to be more into like, you know, okay, what's the stocks doing? The stocks are up around, you know, where they were before. So what are you going to say? Uh, what's oil doing? Oh, oil always goes up and down in an election year. Go back and look. Four years ago. Where was it? Go look back eight years ago. Where was it? Go look back farther. Every time there's an election, oil prices go pfft through the roof and then they do some tricky dicky thing you know to try to get your vote and manipulate it so don't mistake symptoms of you know like the world events you know when they used to tell us that because of the 60s the world's coming to an end because it was free love and god look at the world now <laughs> or that because of you know the, the signs of society you know what has to happen is the literal fulfillment of each and actual scripture that's listed as a prophetic event that happens prior to the coming of Jesus in rapture as an actual event that fulfills the word of God in how he comes and the way he comes and actually is provable by where he presents himself so to speak or reveals himself and how he reveals himself to you because you know, there's this rapture disaster plan, you know, that people have got, you know, the you know, the rapture disaster, you know, well, what if they're in an airplane? Oh, well, if the pilot gets taken, the plane crashes. No, no, we'll discuss that later. But no, or if you're driving a car and you get raptured. <gasps> there's a panic around the world, you know, and the Antichrist is revealed because of the rapture disaster. But they haven't written a book called Rapture Disaster yet. But they will, you know, they've already talked about it so much that now it's prepped the people to receive a book about planning for the rapture disaster when everybody disappears. Ooh. If you have a loved one that disappears, don't be in the car with a Christian. They'll have a warning. You know, don't be around Christians that are flying airplanes. Warning, don't be caught, you know, dead because a Christian got raptured. <laughs> Do you get it? There isn't one scripture in here for the rapture disaster. Not one. 
at all. Not even anything hinting at it. If anything, he says life just went right on. Normal. Two shall be walking the field, one taking the other left. Two should be asleep at night, one taking the other left. No big deal. Now, you want to add to it by saying, well, if two are in the field, then two would be in the plane, you know, and they would be taking. It's not what it said. It's not what it said. Better be very specific in how you read it and how you apply it, because that's what prophecy scholars will do to lead you into what's called fallacies. Where, because A is this and B is this, then we know that C is true. No, we don't know that. A is A, and A always remains A, and B always remains B, and B means B, but you don't add A plus B to equal C. A is A, and B is B, and if you add A plus B, it equals A plus B. That's all. That's all it means. If it doesn't say, it isn't so. Remember that about prophecy. If it doesn't say, it isn't so. That's it. Pure and simple. In 2012, it doesn't say, so it isn't so. The Mayan prophecy was not given for anything to do with the actual word of God. And that's why God will not fulfill his word based upon a pagan theology, irregardless of a coincidence. God doesn't use coincidences. There wasn't a pagan date that Jesus was born on. There wasn't a pagan date that Jesus had the Pentecost occur. There wasn't a pagan symbiology between Passover, Pesach, and the fact that the the, the death of the firstborn of the Son of God, Jesus dying for our sins, Him being the first of many brethren that would come, that we would all be called children of God, sons and daughters of God, occurred at that time? No. As a matter of fact, God fulfills His Word according to His days and His date and accurately 100%, not according to man's days. And so, 2012, bluntly, will not have a rapture in it. Period. You now have a video to not prove why it won't happen, but you have a video to hold me accountable if it happens. So, if it happens, you know, which it won't, then you can show me the video and say, you were wrong. It happened and we're stuck here. <laughs> you see, I'll do something that other people won't do. I'll bet my life on it. And other people aren't going to bet their life on Syria being, you know, like right now the imam or whatever, you know, Syria doing something and getting with Russia and attacking Israel. They're not going to bet their life that Israel will attack Iran for the nuclear development. They're not going to bet their life on things that they've speculated on because, frankly, they know that they have some pieces of information they don't know how to work in yet. Kind of like, you know, when the leading authority in European investment and international monetary investments said, hey, Israel's not going to do anything about it. One of the leading bankers said, well, aren't you worried about Israel attacking Iran? Says, Israel's not going to attack Iran. That's just show. Israel wants to keep the game going for as long as it can to provoke or to somehow invoke either Europe or some other country to get involved with Iran to stop them from building their nuclear facilities so that they don't have to worry about it and do their own subversive techniques and skills with which they're doing, you know, with infiltration and with sabotage and subterfuge. But they will not provoke a holy war by bombing Iran because they know what it'll cause. But they are into manipulating the United States into causing sanctions in such a way that it will be so oppressive that Iran will provoke some type of response from the world, whether in the Straits of Hormuz or in bombing embassies overseas or somewhere where the United States will quickly come to the rescue as they like to play themselves off to be. Or Europe will be so incensed that it will get involved in some way, provoked, so that they will accomplish what Israel will not do, but Israel wants done anyways. Sorry. It ain't gonna happen. You know, they just ain't gonna go out there and bomb a nuclear facility when it ain't gonna work. There's too much diversity going on in Iran and they're very well aware of it. They would prefer more than anything else in the world for Israel to do that so that they could provoke leadership in what's falling apart as far as the religious circle is concerned 
in somehow letting their small sect of Islam or Islamic clerics to somehow be in leadership, which they're not. They don't rule the world. They're not in charge of the world. You know, they don't. Uniformity doesn't happen in Islam. There's lots of clerics from different points of view doing all kinds of different things, and you should know that. I mean, come on. You know, look at Christianity. How many denominations you got in Christianity? Same thing's true in Islam. It's not unified. Please start getting that impression. You know that somehow you know all Muslims agree on everything. No, they don't. <laughs> not at all. They disagree quite a bit. Just whoever's exciting, you know, to follow at the time, kind of like what people do in Christianity, they follow at the time, some people. And so they get all excited about that part, or not. And so, be aware of the deception that's happening in 2012, where you're getting kind of like used to picking wrong things, because the burnout is what's coming. Right after 2012 is when we should be winding up for like Probably 2015 is where I would say a good date. But 2012 is going to set you up for a fall come 2013, where deception begins to become prevalent, self-deception, in kind of not wanting to deal with the reality of studying prophecy and proving what is accurate and sharing the gospel of Jesus to the people who need to hear it. That's what will happen. That is our basis for this entire video ministry is that we know what's going to happen to the world as far as Christendom is concerned. There's going to be a pulling back because there's kind of like a burnout. Kind of like people getting more involved in politics right now in 2012 than actually getting involved in saving the politician because they don't want to get the politician saved. They want to get what they want instead. And how there's been this whole huge involvement of these political people inside of Christianity that are saying what Christians believe that really don't. You know, like this hyper uber patriotism. Do you see that as being godly? You know, how America is ooh, Christian nation. When did we start saying that? You know, it's kind of interesting. Whenever you hear the word Christian nation, you should immediately refer yourself to Rome and the Catholic Church. Because that's what you're doing. You're playing Catholic and you're calling yourself Catholic nation. Because that's what Catholic means, militant, the militant church. And you're becoming exactly what the Catholics did in most of the nations around the world when they too likewise called it a Christian nation. Because then you're putting someone down and you're promoting yourself as something that's false. We're not a Christian nation. We're a democratic nation. Jesus would not save this nation Jesus will bless us if we ask Him to. He will restore us if we ask Him to. He will encourage us if we ask Him to. He will lead us to where we are citizens of, which is heaven and not earth. Because you see, the land that we are in, we should bless. But we should never inhabit as our own. We should sojourn here passing through the same way that the children of Israel did in Babylon. The same way that they did in Egypt in the same way that they finally went home in the end. Likewise, you too need to realize this is not our home. I love this new song that came out that says something about I am not of this place. I am going someplace else or something. I can't think of it. This is not where I belong. Take the You know it. Take the world, give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. Yeah, it's just a marching song, but it's so right on because that's where people have gotten this Zionism idea wrong, this political idea wrong, the symptoms of deceiving the church wrong. You know, this kind of like you know, getting involved in all this other stuff wrong. We should be sharing Jesus and revealing him to a world that really is vastly running down into the sewers and septic tanks, you know, in order to drown themselves, you know, in the coming world events that will destroy the majority of the population. It's sad. And it should be. And we should be sober minded. 
that we should be pulling away from really all this kind of like, you know, gimmicky stuff, especially in prophecy. We should already know what the facts are and just keep repeating them over and over and over again. And that's what we'll do in biblical prophecy today when we start the series that is teaching and not discussion and not topical. We're going to do Bible study in biblical prophecy today. And when we do, we'll study the Bible and we'll applicably show and reveal that which God has said is true and is going to happen in your generation. This is no doubt about it. And this is why I, I'm different than some prophecy scholars or some prophecy sages, teachers, expositors, whatever you want to call them. Some idiot that's got you know some credentials that says, you know, hey, I published a bunch of books, you know. Yeah, so what? You know, I will tell you right, bluntly, you will not see your children grow up. Some of you. You will not see your grandchildren grow up. Some of you. And if you're planning on great-grandchildren, forget it. You see, that's where your Bible scholar won't say that, will he? He won't say, being in the last generation, you will not see your grandchildren grow up. Funny how that works, isn't it? When you put the rubber to the road, ask your favorite person, whoever it is, well, if Jesus could come any time, do you expect them, your grandchildren, to grow up? Do you expect to have grandchildren? Do you expect to have children? You can ask my wife. Or you can ask anybody who knows me. I've been saying this for a long time. And it's a fact of my life. You will not, because we are the last generation. Now, I'll give you something as a teaser, you know, in biblical prophecy today. One of those symptoms, okay? Kind of like a symptom, not a not a prophecy to fulfill. But I can tell you if these Bible scholars would say these are symptoms or these are what I think or you know possibilities, you know, not a probability, then I would tell you, hey, I agree with them. Because a lot of what they say, I agree with. But when they say that it's an actual scripture, I don't agree with them. Because that's why we stick with biblical. Because speculation is speculation. And that's what I don't agree with these guys when they speculate. Because they won't admit that they're speculating. And I can prove it. You know, I don't want to go to a conference and start you know, fighting with every single one of them. Because, frankly, they're there in order to promote some wild idea. Huh. But in getting into speculation, let me throw something out at you. Billy Graham was alive before Israel became a nation. Chuck Smith was alive before Israel became a nation. Charles Stanley, if I recall, was alive before Israel became a nation. You know, there's an awful lot of generation alive before Israel became a nation. In prophecy, it is interesting because you can look back into the land of when Israel moved into the land or different prophetic events that we can read and compare and when Israel was held back from going into the land that generation which is the first time that they used it that generation would not enter into the land until these things be fulfilled because they doubted Interesting, isn't it? Moses didn't go in the land. Moses was uh, considered the lawgiver. I want to give you one for all you Calvary Chapel people. If you love the Lord and you love Chuck, you know, kind of like we all kind of love Chuck, you know, his grandfather, you know, kind of want to see him around forever, you know, want him to live forever. But he's the one who first said, hey, look, if I'm dropped dead, you know, one day with a heart attack, don't you go reviving me. Or if I'm dead, don't you go resurrecting me. Because I'll hit you. And I remember that teaching. And I took it to heart. So I'm going to give you my version of that. Add it on into one little bit. It's probable. And we of the Jesus people, being the last generation, will not see Chuck enter into the rapture. Oh, he'll, he'll go home to be with the Lord. Of that I'm convinced. Because I think we really had an apostle in our midst. And I'm not into Pentecostal and apostolic and all that other garbage. But I mean, we really had a man of God that was anointed with that kind of ministry. But until Billy Graham is gone, and until Chuck is gone, and until some of these other highly influential men of God are gone, 
and I do believe in the next few years, then I dare say to you that part of the reasons, not the prophetic reasons, or not the biblical reasons, but my opinion reasons. See, I have probably 16, maybe more, prophecies that I think absolutely no way could be 2012. You know, and I have quite a few that probably say not 2013, but you know they start to increase. So I just tell people be ready from 2013 onward. But when it comes to my personal opinion stuff, you know, my speculation stuff, ooh, come on, Calvaries, you know, you guys study prophecy, think about it, and you got a brain and a noggin. You really think Chuck's gonna be around for the event, pre-trip, checking out, you know? Or did he actually, was he old enough to like be excluded? Kind of like you know, how Moses saw the land, but didn't enter in. Could be, couldn't it? Now, Billy Graham, I'm convinced, you know, I think he's got to check out way before we even begin to start talking. You know, Billy Graham checks out in 2012, we might start talking. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it ain't going to happen in 2012. So God bless you in your supposition, speculations, and advertising and you know kind of ideas about prophecy but when we get done with this topical kind of like introduction to biblical prophecy today in these video series I really want to get into some solid teaching where we get into the, the guts of you know where we get you know maybe some Missler stuff you know maybe some Jewish stuff maybe some Schneerson stuff Ooh, Schneerson he said something <laughs> I'm kidding but you know stuff from around the world you know that we can sit down and say look and we'll take a board for it and we'll say this is speculation by this guy. Now this is prophecy, so the speculation might be true. So this is why we kind of like put a probability of a certain amount on it and why we really think that we should hang on to this piece, you know, of the puzzle. And we might even, by that time, maybe, you know, if I have you know, another board, we might take a little board, you know, and build this giant picture, you know, with pieces of prophecy puzzle put together to see if all the pieces fit. Because you never know. We just might have enough time to do it. And then again, we just might be doing it when the Lord returns. God bless you. But please, don't, don't be planning on 2012. Please, do what God wants you to do today. Occupy till He comes, yes. Know that, yes, we are in the last generation. Know your children aren't going to grow up, so no offense. You know, If you want a retirement account, well, fine. You know, I didn't. I don't. I'm not planning on it. You know? But that's the difference between me and someone else that I'm kind of putting my money where my mouth is, you know. I've always believed this. I've always lived it this way. I've always taught people to live this way. You live according to the will and the mercy of God as He's designed you. If you're planning and sitting down and got this, you know, fantastic retirement plan that you've got all lined out, praise the Lord. If that's what God's told you to do, good. It'll be used for something. I don't know, to burn or to bless somebody or, you know, if you're gone, if what's going to go with it. But it'll be used for something. You know that. And maybe that's what God wanted you to do. Maybe He wanted to teach you discipline through the process of planning these things out and how to organize your finances and how to do this and that and the other thing. Those are all accomplishing things. But that doesn't mean the prophecy is fulfilled because you got to get your retirement account, you know, whatever. Uh-uh. I'm sorry. You know, God doesn't reward you according to your financial portfolio. You know. Well, I got stock board, so guess what? You know, I get ten cities because I have stock in, you know, Berkshire Farms or whatever it is. But rather, God wants you to invest in his kingdom according to what he tells you to do, and you do irregardless of people watching you. And that is your riches in heaven. So in prophecy, think about Jesus. Think about his return. Plan on knowing that the people around you are probably overzealous about their studies and scriptures about prophecy and know for certain that I'm telling you and you can email me write comments on this video or whatever you want to do it is not it is not it is not 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 <laughs> not eh, ninguno yet lo going to happen the rapture in 2012 God bless you. He is coming. Jesus is coming very soon. And as they say, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. But he that is just, let him be just still. But let us pray for the mercy and grace of God to go from us to others, that some, whosoever would, that would come unto him, would be saved.